we haven't met, my name is Tim Reeves. I get the honor to serve as the lead minister here at First Christian. Happy Easter to you. And we're going to just jump right in today, if that's all right with you. So buckle your seatbelt. I'm excited for where we're going to go. We're going to talk about something that everyone has a thought about. Even if you don't want to think about this, you have to think about this. You have to face it. Some people think they know for certain. Some people think it doesn't matter. Some people wonder about it, honestly. Maybe you. What are we going to talk about today? We're going to talk about a question that we all deal with. Can we know, can we hope to know what happens when we die? Every single one of us has thought about it. And you can't go through Easter weekend talking about the cross, which is an instrument of death, without talking about what death is and what are we to make of it. Now, modern people essentially have three ideas about what happens after we die, outside of the Christian view, which we'll unpack some. And and you might be camped out in one of these. And if that's where you're at, I don't want you to feel like pointed out or anything. I want you to know that I get it. I understand it. I've been there. But basically, here's, here's kind of three views about what happens after we die. Uh, the first one is kind of this view that, well, when you die, you're done. Death is the end of you. And a very popular philosopher in about the third century BC, maybe it's the fourth century BC, uh, just a couple hundred years before Jesus, his name is Epicurus, he popularized this philosophy. He has this quote. Let me read this quote to you. He says, if I am... So if I'm alive, death is not. If death is, I am not. Why should I fear that which can only exist when I do not? And so his view is we don't need to fear it. And a lot of people have this view. In fact, I saw a TikTok video the other day that had that quote on it while the person was like scuba diving down to the depths of the ocean. And it said, I live by this quote. And, and I thought, wow, that, that's what's giving you the courage to just kind of live it up. And that was Epicurus' philosophy. It really caught on, especially in modern times. But basically, it's the idea that this is all there is, so make the most of it now. Live for what brings you pleasure, not in a hedonistic way, but in an altruistic way, you know. What brings you joy, go after that. Do that. This is all there is. And when you die, your consciousness is gone And so why would you be afraid of that? Because your feelings are gone. We're afraid of the feeling of death. And if you don't feel anything anymore because you're dead, then why should you be afraid of something you can't feel? Okay? And a lot of people live this way. So that's that's a modern view. Another modern view is what we call kind of a pantheistic view of death. It's kind of a, you know, a word that I'll break down. Pan means everything and theistic means God. And so in other words, everything is God. What is this view? Well, this, when you die, you reassimilate back into the universe, okay? And the universe kind of allowed you to be here, and now when you die, you become part of it in a different way. You kind of go back into the material that you came from. And so make sure you did a really good job while you were here honoring it, respecting it, because, you know, you don't want to end up somewhere that's a not-so-good part of the universe later. This is a huge view that people have. Another view is what I'll call wishful thinking, and I'm going to get into uh, some of these views in our next series, but just for right now, this is the idea that there's probably a better place after this place, and most of us go there unless you're really, really bad. You don't go there. Okay, that's what I call wishful thinking. It's not based on anything. Each of these three views have a piece of it, I think. We shouldn't fear death. So I think that's good. You know, it, we are part of something bigger. I think that's right. And our actions kind of matter. And so, so we take pieces of these views and we can understand that the, all of these views are getting at some of it. Now, Epicurus himself was a philosopher and behind this view of death, he had this major struggle. A lot of people have this struggle. You might have this struggle. But basically, he didn't really believe in God or the gods. And if they did exist, he thought that they either didn't care about us or they weren't very good, 
or very strong. And so in other words, he couldn't understand how can God be all-powerful, all-knowing, all-loving, and yet allowing pain and grief and death. This was his struggle. This is what led him to believe that this is all there is. I can't imagine a God who would allow death. It doesn't make sense. All pain in his worldview is, is evil and to be avoided. And so how, how can I, why would I want to follow some God who allows, who allows pain? He's not a very good God if he's real at all. And so his followers and people who've adopted his view in the early you know, centuries uh, put on their tombstone this quote in Latin. Here's what it says. Non fui, fui, non sum, non curo. Did you guys catch that? Here's what they wrote on their tombstones. I was not. I was. I am not. I do not care. Because they thought that all there was was this material world where we experience life, make the most of it, and then it's gone. We don't need to fear after this. What do you think? Every human being has to think about this question. You can ignore it. You can pretend it's not real, that it's not coming for you or for me. What happens when someone dies? And can we know for certain what happens to us, to our loved ones, to people? It's Resurrection Sunday. We've been in a series called Cross-Examine. We've looked at conversations that have happened before the cross, on the cross, and today we're going to have a look at a conversation that happened after the cross. We're going to be in Luke chapter 24. So if you have a phone, I suggest type in it in your app or your Google search bar, pull out a Bible. Luke 24, starting with verse 13, I'm going to read several verses here, and I just want you to immerse yourself into this conversation because it's really fascinating. Luke by the way, is the only one of the gospel writers that records this conversation. And if you know anything about Luke, let me just assure you, Luke is very intelligent. He was a doctor. And the entire purpose he set out when he wrote the book of Luke was to examine every eyewitness account about the resurrection and the life of Jesus and put it in an orderly way for other people to be able to look at it themselves. And in the account, he specifically, in this story, lists the name. Why does Luke do that? Because Luke knows that that person is still alive when he writes, so he puts his name in there so that if anybody's wondering, did this really happen? Do you know what? They just went and said, let's go ask that person. Maybe he'll verify it. Luke starts like this. Verse 13. Now the same day, so this is Resurrection Sunday. Now the same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. The trial, the crucifixion of Jesus. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them, named Cleopas, asked him, are you the only one? Visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days. Everybody from the region flocked for Passover. Everybody's there. It's a public spectacle. What things? He asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests, our rulers, handed him over to be sentenced to death and they crucified him. But I want you to hear the pain and the grief in this next verse. But we had hoped. In other words, we don't have hope anymore. We had it. 
and now it's gone. That he, we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it's the third day. Since all this took place, in addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning. They didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see Jesus. He said to them, how foolish you are and how slow to believe all of the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on. This is awkward. He continues on as if he were going farther. But they urged him strongly, stay with us, for it is nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread. He gave thanks. He broke it, and he began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? They got up. And they returned at once. Everybody say, at once to Jerusalem. There they found the eleven and those with them assembled together and saying, It is true. The Lord has risen and appeared to Simon Peter. Then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. Fascinating conversation. So here you have two followers of Jesus One of them is named Cleopas. And then there's a mystery person who's not named. We don't really know who that is. It could be another follower of Jesus. Some say it also might be Cleopas' wife. And so here we have Cleopas. Most likely, if you look at John chapter 19, it's the same person that John writes as Clopas, with no E before the O. And Clopas was at the cross with his wife. So we don't know who the other person is, but likely this person is Cleopas. And Luke intentionally puts his name in here. Why? Because Cleopas is the brother of Joseph, Mary's husband. You know, Joseph and Mary and Christmas and all that. And so what does this mean? This means the brother of Joseph who saw Jesus live from peewee to prophet, who also was at the cross and with his own eyes saw the pain and the grief and the suffering. And upon further examination, he could see that Jesus did in fact die. That he was dead. He's the same person who heard the reports of resurrection. And so when these two travelers were examining the cross, and now they're being cross-examined by Jesus, what did they see? They saw a dead hope. Isn't it interesting that these two We're not expecting resurrection. They're on their way out of town because they think their hope has died. This isn't that hard to understand because in their experience and your experience and every Jewish person's experience in the first century, when dead people die, they stay dead. They weren't expecting a literal resurrection, in time and space, Jesus. So to them, Jesus' death rendered a dead end, a dead hope. How is it then that every follower of Jesus looks at the cross and basically says it's a loss? How is it then that the cross 
has become the hope of the world. And I'll tell you why. The resurrection. It's the only explanation when you really examine it. The resurrection is either the greatest hope or the greatest fraud. And you and I, we get to decide. So when we examine it, we have to take this story into account. These two travelers in this account, they went from hopeless, did you notice that? To completely changed throughout a conversation. One conversation changed their life and their direction. Something changed the way they view life and death and this encounter with Jesus. So back to our big question. How do you know what happens? How do you know for certain? Can you know for certain what happens when you die? And I want to look at four realities of the resurrection And when we understand these realities, and I'm going to unpack them from this story, they're each going to build on one another. And in order to have hope, to have certainty, you have to understand these four realities. I'm going to give them to you up front. The resurrection is a historical event. The resurrection answers our deepest questions. The resurrection is a personal encounter of love. And fourthly, the resurrection is a powerful hope. For the world. We're going to unpack these one by one. The first one, the resurrection is a historical event. Now, I could spend hours and hours unpacking the historicity of the resurrection and all the evidence that stacks up. I don't have that kind of time today. But if you're interested more, I suggest you research. You can look up arguments for the resurrection of Jesus. You could ask me some other time. I'll point you some directions. But I'm just going to give you three real quickly, okay? Three quick arguments. The first one is, Just in this story, the two travelers were not expecting resurrection. How do I know that? Look at the direction they're heading. And this fits because they're Jewish. You see, Jewish people in the first century would not have invented resurrection. Why? Well, on the one hand, people don't raise from the dead. You're going to hang a new belief system under the oppression of two empires on the idea that someone raises from the dead, good luck. So that's the obvious one. The second one is this truth, and this escapes many, many people. The Jewish religion already believed in resurrection. They believed that everyone at the end of the age would resurrect and there would be judgment. And so for these followers of Jesus, they wouldn't invent resurrection because they already had it. No one in the Old Testament taught literal resurrection. Jesus spoke about it some, but they didn't quite understand it. And so the idea that these individuals were hoping for resurrection is completely misunderstanding who they were. They weren't hoping for resurrection. Do you know what they're hoping for? Revolution. Let's overthrow Rome. Let's overthrow the corrupt leaders here. And then we'll restore our national prominence. We'll live our lives in some glory age. We'll die, and then we'll all be at the final ending. That was what they believed. That was their worldview. But then, in the first century, you have all of these followers completely changing the definition of what resurrection is in the matter of you know, years from the resurrection of Jesus. That kind of thing is not likely to be invented. And it doesn't sound very wise to kind of throw over on the world. So so the invention of resurrection is not likely from a first century person. The second one I'm going to look at is Jesus' death was public. What do I mean by this? Well, there's two things I mean by this. Is that, could you imagine trying to orchestrate death and resurrection publicly at Passover to fill every scripture You have to somehow coerce the mighty Roman government and the Jewish leaders that hated Jesus to conspire with you to create this perfect story that fulfilled all the prophecies of the Old Testament. 
And by the way, every follower didn't believe that Jesus actually rose when they first heard the news. See, Jesus' death was public. In other words, trying to throw one over on people would require an enormous amount of coincidences that seem very, very unlikely. Here's the other indicator from that. Christianity is the only publicly launched, the only publicly launched religion in the world today. What do I mean by this? I mean that if you, for instance, consider Islam, how did Islam start? It started in a cave where God showed up and revealed a better and newer version of what to do through Muhammad. And Muhammad wrote it down, taught a bunch of people, people started following it. Take Buddhism, for example. Siddhartha discovered you know, some practices. It's seven or eight, I can't remember. Some practices that he escaped suffering by practicing these seven or eight things. And you can, you can do them too. And so, so here are the seven or eight things from humans that will help you escape suffering and deal with death and deal with pain. Every single one of them were, were received in a private manner and then publicized. But the death of Jesus was the most public skeptic, spectacle the world has ever seen. You, you don't invent that because the deniability is so high. I mean, so many people are aware of what's going on. Did you notice in the text? How are you the only one that doesn't know what happened? Everyone saw Jesus die. So for this movement to catch steam, there better be some credibility to the claim that no one has ever made that there's an empty tomb and a risen Jesus and people are going to be willing to die for this message. What makes the gospel so unique is it's public and it's different than every other religion or worldview. I like what the Washington Post in 1985, there's an article written, what Fim Perkins says, early Christians did not link their mission to evangelize the world with claims about the superiority of Jesus' teaching. That's what every other religion or philosophy does. Rather, they linked it to the event of the resurrection. That is the beginning of our faith. Not, not Jesus' teaching, that's a part of it. But the, the foundation of our faith is the cross, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus, and there's nothing in the world like it, and it doesn't come close. Imagine fabricating that. Finally, most historians concede, secular alike, the best logical explanation for the rapid rise of Christianity in the Roman world, throughout the West, across the world, is a genuine belief in resurrection by believers. So here we have these two cross-examiners journeying away from the hope they thought was dead out of Jerusalem. And our best explanation of them leaving is that they thought their hope died and they weren't trusting in resurrection. They weren't thinking about resurrection. They were, they were lost. They were hurt. They were grieving. They were in pain. But something happened to them and it changed their worldview and it changed their direction. What happened? They witnessed an historical risen Jesus. The resurrection is a historical event. Secondly, the resurrection answers our deepest questions. As these two travelers are leaving the cross, they're discussing things. They're asking questions. They don't understand the cross. They're asking things like, what does all this mean? Why did God allow? We thought he was doing this. What are we going to do now? Who are we now? We followed this and now our hope died. Where are we at? Every human being asks these four questions that we can kind of see surface in their conversation. But here's four questions, and I'm going to get at these four questions, and I'm going to kind of hop around, so I hope you hang with me. But four questions that every human being asks are, who am I? Why am I here? Why is it broken? You don't have to live too long to see the world is broken and wonder, why is that? And then, why do we die? Why do we die? All of us experience those questions and, and whether we know it or not, try to offer answers. Now, Jesus seems to allow himself to be disguised to these travelers, which we don't really know why. 
There's all kinds of theories that are, that are given. Um, you know, they could be so traumatized by his death and so, you know, because they know dead people don't raise, they, they would never think that that's Jesus there because they just, they saw him die. Other people say that Jesus is enacting outwardly what was going on in them, inwardly a lack of faith. But I think this text is teaching us that even when they saw Jesus, they didn't see him. Throughout his entire life, they missed it. They didn't understand what Jesus was here to do. They didn't understand who Jesus really was. He was right in front of them for years, especially Cleopas from Pee Wee to Prophet, and he never really understood who Jesus was. Verse 25, Jesus kind of gets in their business a little bit, and he gets in our business too. It feels harsh. He looks at them, and he says, how foolish are you? You're foolish. Like, why are you foolish? Why are you lacking faith? Why are you slow to believe everything that's been written? And you saw it all come to fruition. Why are you foolish? And this word foolish literally just means like a lack of understanding, a gap, an unanswered question. How can you not see me? I'm right in front of you. I've always been, I've been in the scripture all this time. I've been trying to teach you and now you don't get what's going on. So Jesus begins to answer who we are. Who are you? Well, I'm really sorry to deliver this, but you're foolish. To your core. I'm foolish. What does that mean? That means we don't really understand who Jesus is. See, they wanted the restoration and revolution of Israel more than they wanted the risen Jesus. And this is our fundamental problem. When we fail to identify Jesus, what we do is we misplace our hope and we put them in lesser things. So for them, it was in revolution. For us, it's money or pleasure or status or relationships, or appearance. And when we don't have these lesser things, we also don't have hope. Like if you don't have, some of you put your hope in health, and if you don't have health, you don't have hope. These are lesser things. And it's foolish to put our our hope in something that's finite, that is temporary. It's foolish because at our core, every single person chooses to break and go against God's moral law. Maybe you don't believe in God's moral law. I'll say it like this. You have broken your own moral law. You would probably tell me, minus the Bible, lying is wrong. Judging someone harshly is wrong. Hating someone is wrong. But you've broken your own law law. Have you ever had to apologize for something? Did you know it was wrong before you did it? You still did it. You broke not just God's law, but your own moral law. And we do it because for a moment we think it's good, we think it's best, we think it's going to give us our most free expression of self, you know, the most in this life. And it ends us in a place of pain. We we don't put our hope in God. We put our hope in something else. And what is that? That's foolish. See, when you and I do foolish things, it causes pain. You didn't need me to tell you that. It causes grief. It causes suffering, and that's what's broken with the world. You and I breaking our own moral law and formed by God has caused so much pain. Why do we die? Because we kill each other. We lie to ourselves. We reject God. And God, and this is the part we don't understand, And God, in his wisdom, sees human beings causing pain and grief continually. And he says, 
The punishment for that is to die. And it seems harsh to us, but let's look at it from God's perspective. You can understand this. Do you really think human beings are going to figure it out? Do you think we're going to figure out how to fix all the injustices and all the brokenness and comfort all the griefs? And, or are we just going to create more? And so God in his wisdom, he knows this. And we don't understand it. We don't understand dying. At times I don't understand it. But I can tell you this, you never will unless you understand who you really are. And you can't understand who you really are unless you understand who God really is. And you can't understand who God really is unless you understand what the cross means. And these two travelers did not understand the cross. Their hope had died. And so Jesus says, all the scriptures... Are you slow to see they're all about me? And he explains it to them. He explains the cross. He explains he's the suffering servant. He explains he's the promised Messiah. He's not just a prophet. He's also the son of God, God in flesh to come and save the world. Who is Jesus? It's so important to understand who that is, to understand who you are, to understand why you're here, to understand where all this is going, why it's broken. John Calvin in a preface to a French translation of the New Testament in the 1500s, he wrote this about who Jesus is. Christ is Isaac, the beloved son of the father who was offered as a sacrifice, but nevertheless did not succumb to the power of death. He is Jacob, the watchful shepherd who has such great care for the sheep which he guards. He is the good and compassionate brother Joseph who in his glory was not ashamed to acknowledge his brothers, however lowly and abject their condition. He's the great sacrificer and bishop Melchizedek who has offered an eternal sacrifice once for all. He is the sovereign lawgiver Moses writing his law on the tablets of our hearts by his spirit. He is the faithful captain and guide Joshua to lead us to the promised land. He is the victorious and noble King David bringing by his hand all rebellious power to subjection. He is the magnificent and triumphant King Solomon governing his kingdom in peace and prosperity. He is the strong and powerful Samson who by his death has overwhelmed all of his enemies. This is what we should in short seek in the whole of scripture, truly to know Jesus Christ and the infinite riches that are comprised in him and are offered to us by him from God the Father. If one were to sift thoroughly through the law and the prophets, he would find not a single word which would not draw and bring us to Jesus. Therefore, rightly does St. Paul say in another passage that he would know nothing except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Jesus tells the two followers, everything in scripture is about me. I am God who has come to you. I'll explain it like this. Maybe you're familiar with the movie City of Angels. It came out in the 90s. Some of you may not know that movie. Uh, but uh, a popular song came from that movie. It's called Iris. It's by the Goo Goo Dolls. Um, and let me just unpack this movie for you. Nicolas Cage and Meg Ryan are the kind of stars of this movie. And Nicolas Cage's character, well, he, he's an immortal angel. And his job, his role is to visit people upon death and usher them to the next stage of life. And then he sees a woman, a human woman, and he falls in love with her. And the only way he can have that love is by giving up his immortality and becoming a human himself. And so that's exactly what Nicolas Cage's character does. And the moment he becomes human, he begins to experience things he doesn't quite expect, Pain, struggle, things not going his way. All an effort to find her. And then he finds her, his love. And then the worst thing of all happens. He watches her die. And in that moment, the character in that movie experiences the hardest of all human pains, watching someone you love pass away. Now, the writer of the song Iris is John Reznick, and 
he wrote this as he was thinking of this song, trying to capture what was happening in that movie. He said, I was thinking about the situation of the Nicolas Cage character in the movie. This guy is completely willing to give up his own immortality just to be able to feel something very human. And I think, wow, what an amazing thing it must be, to, to, must be like to love someone so much that you would give up everything to be with them. That's a pretty heavy thought. He becomes human so that he can be with the one he loves. He feels the deepest human pain. Do you remember the song? I'd give up forever to touch you. I'd give up my immortality just to be close to you. I don't think that they'd understand. They might not understand what I'm doing as out of love. Do you see? In Jesus, God is telling you who you are, and it's bigger than a romance story. See, God was willing, willing to look foolish, to become human, to give up heaven, to experience pain and gruesome death for fools, for us. So who are you? Make no mistake, you are foolish. You've broken your own moral law, let alone God's. But you are loved deeply deeply by your heavenly father. Why are you here? Let's go back to the song. Just, I just want you to know who I am is, is the refrain in that song. And that's exactly what God wants for you. That's exactly what God is doing as he enters into humanity, as he takes up the suffering of a cross. He wants you to know his love. That's why you're here. He wants to correct the pain that we've caused by taking on pain himself. And he wants you to reflect his love forever and ever to the world, to experience him, to experience hope. And what's wrong with the world? We don't hope most in that. We hope in other things to provide us with that serenity outside of the love of God. He loves you deeply. See, you can't answer your deepest questions without considering who is God. And you can't know who you are without knowing who God is. And you can't understand any of that without understanding the cross. Now, the resurrection is a personal encounter of love. It's historical. It's intellectual and philosophical. It answers your deepest questions. But it's also a personal encounter. Did you notice that Jesus talks with them, they explain things, they have this, you know, lively conversation, they unpack ideas, and then he just sort of like, well, I'm just going to keep going. It's really interesting that he does this, but what do they do? They invite him in. It's almost as if Jesus wants them to do that. What does this mean? It means that at some point, the resurrection of Jesus has to be more than a historical event, it has to be more than an intellectual or philosophical pursuit. It has to be deeply personal. See, it's when they're breaking bread with Jesus, when they're doing relationship with Jesus, when they're in an intimate room that they see Jesus, that they experience the resurrection of Jesus. For centuries, Christians have said, I believed in the historical resurrection. I understand the philosophical implications. And then I had an experience with the risen Jesus. And the rest of us kind of look on and go, I don't know if you can validate that. But let me just tell you, in my own journey, I was in a pit of despair. I was in a hole of addiction. What did I do? I chose to live as if it was my only life. Pursued pleasure in every way I wanted. And do you know what I resulted? In pain. And in the height of that pain, in the height of that depression, I got on my knees one night and I said, God, if you are there, will you show yourself to me, not intellectually, personally? I want to feel your presence. I don't just want to, want to be able to you know, write a thesis statement about you. 
Show me who you are. Two weeks later, I would never be in the next place ever again. I was out of town. I happened to be at a high school graduation, and the person was talking about Jesus because it was a Christian school. And at that moment, I knew that maybe God was Jesus. And then do you know what I did? I went out and I searched and I examined and I wondered, is Jesus God? And it wasn't until weeks after that that I said, okay, God, I believe in you. I I need your love. I see that you've died for me. Will you come in? Will you wash me of my sin? And will you give me this hope that I've never had? Because all I know is pain and you promise a way out of pain. And I'm putting my trust in you. Do you have a personal encounter with the risen Jesus? Because until you do, you will never experience the hope of the resurrection. The resurrection is the hope for all the world. It's a powerful hope. It was so powerful that these two travelers who had their hopes dashed on a dime, walked seven miles away from hope, said, you know what? We're turning around and walking seven miles back to Jerusalem. Did you understand that? Seven miles is a long way to walk. They didn't waste any time. I wouldn't even drive seven miles if I didn't believe in something. So, so they're heading back because they experience a powerful, powerful hope. And that hope that they saw was written about by Luke. And it's for you to understand today as you examine the cross. When you understand the cross with the resurrection, it changes your direction. You see yourself differently. You see God differently. You make decisions differently. And finally, you understand and see and think about death differently than the rest of the world. When you see the cross with the resurrection, what do you see? You see a demonstration, Romans 5, 8. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, while we were still fools, Christ died for us. While we still didn't get it, while it was hard for us to understand, while we're struggling in, in the broken world, Jesus enters in and he looks the most foolish to die for a foolish human race because he wants to restore everything all out of pure love. What if God and Jesus Christ has stepped into the world out of love to fix the world that you and I broke, to reconcile you to him, to forgive you of your sins, and to give you eternal life? He was willing to look foolish to save foolish ones. It's on us now to decide, will we look foolish to other people? Romans 10, 9 says, if you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, which to some people is foolish, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, what are you putting your faith in? Not just the cross, the cross with the resurrection. Raised him from the dead, you will be saved as with your heart that you believe and are justified as with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. As scripture says, anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame. When you examine the cross and you believe its message, the net result is saved. Saved from what? A world of suffering, of grief, of pain, pain we created. You're saved out of it. You're taken out of it. When you close your eyes in death and you're a believer in Jesus and you believe in the resurrection, you close your eyes in hope. Because you open them at the next moment as a transformed bodily, glorified body that Jesus has redeemed and restored and you live and share in his love forever and ever and ever. Dr. Jeremiah Johnston tells a story. He's a a scholar out of Oxford, Christian. He says the resurrection is a powerful hope. So powerful and personal because his sister, well, Recently, they had a stillborn baby. And that's difficult. And that's grieving. Why does that happen? But there's no philosophy, there's no intellectualism that will ever comfort you in your deepest pain than a Jesus who entered into pain to take away pain forever and ever and ever. The only solution to suffering that makes any sense to me is a God who would enter suffering himself to die the death we deserve. They talk about that stillborn child. They, they, they use 
the username because they believe the first time she opened her eyes was seeing Jesus. She's not dead. She's living. And we have a living hope. And it's powerful. Jesus looked our greatest enemy, sin, death, and shame, and he conquered it. I don't know what enemy you're looking at in the face right now. It might be an illness. It might be a depression. It might be an uncertain future. It might be a hard thing you're going through. But here is what I know. You don't have to wonder what happens when you die because Jesus rose from the grave. And every day, even if we're going through something, we can be reassured that Jesus himself entered pain to save us from pain. He didn't exclude himself. He went through it so he could give us freedom. How can you be sure? Because Jesus loves you and he died. Remember above his cross what it said? Here, the king of the Jews, right? We could change that to say maybe the king of fools because that's who we are. But then he takes that off real quick and puts the king of death. There's nothing you're facing through your belief in the cross and the resurrection that you will not overcome. What is the Christian hope? When you die, you are forever with your Savior. This is not all there is. And in that place, there's no sickness, there's no shame, there's no grief, there's no suffering. He is fixing the world and we have an eternal hope in him. You have three choices today. Will you doubt it? You can leave today and say, I'm not sure. Maybe you should look, look into it. You can leave here today and you could declare, you could say, you know what? I need to make Jesus my Lord. And if that's you, you need to go back to the 103. Let's pray together. Maybe during our next song, you pray. You say, God, just come in. Show me who you are. Forgive me of my sin. Maybe you need to get baptized. It's a picture of your faith and the resurrection of Jesus. Finally, will you let it direct you? You can't believe in something so great as the resurrection and not somehow direct the rest of your life, the rest of your week, the rest of your decisions, the rest of your finances, the rest of the way you do relationships. You cannot divorce a faith in the resurrection with what you do on a daily basis. Maybe you need to say, okay, the power of God in Jesus is gonna direct me from here on out. Jesus has conquered the grave. We have a hope that is personal, it's historical, it's philosophical, it makes sense, and it's powerful. We're gonna sing a song, and then we're gonna take communion together. Would you pray with me? God, I wanna thank you so much for the good news of resurrection. It is the hope of the world. It has the power to take a broken life and make it new. It has the power to defeat sin, to defeat shame, to defeat death. We don't fear the grave. We know there's something more. We know it's you. We see it most clearly in the love you've shown on the cross. And so in the next few moments, here's what we're gonna do, God. We're gonna thank you. We're gonna thank you for suffering yourself. Thank you for the blood. Thank you for salvation. Thank you for newness in life. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Hey, would you stand? Let's sing.